Amen, and brethren, hearken unto me. Amen. Okay. All ears. No questions tonight. No, no. I have no notes. I got a message, and um, that's a miracle all by itself. Let's have a word of prayer, and you pray that God will help me deliver this message like I do in the shower. Okay. Anybody ever sing in, in the car? Sing in the car by themselves? Yeah. When I'm in the car, driving home, I preach real good. I'm eloquent. I'm a great preacher. In the shower, I'm better. When I come out here, everything I want to say and the way I want to say it, it all falls to pieces. So tonight I want you to pray that the Lord will give us a shower message. Okay, and it'll come out the way he gave it to me as close as possible. Okay? All right. Dear gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for another day that you've kept us. You kept us, O oh God, for since Sunday. There are all kinds of things, seen and unseen. And we thank you for it, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the life and the health and the strength you've given us, O oh Lord. Most of all, God, we thank you, Lord, for picking us out of a vast number and predestinating us from the foundation of the world to save us. We know, God, that we're not saved because we merit it or because we earned it, but you just simply decided to love us. And based on that alone, we're here. Lord, you've been downloading to us for some time now about what's going to take place in the last days. You said you no longer speak in, par in Proverbs, but you're going to speak to us clearly. And you've been true to your word. We ask, oh God, you give us hearts to believe the clear message you're bringing. Not to doubt them, not to question them, not to wonder if the Lord among us or not, but to grab hold with a faith and a tenacity, oh God, that will not be relinquished. We pray, Lord, for this whole church in these last days. We realize, oh God, that we have a battle, we have a fight, and you <coughs> called us, oh Lord, as a particular group of people, oh Lord assigned to be here to the very end, to be changed at the very end, O oh Lord. We claim that promise, we hold to it, and we ask the Lord you give us the faith and the grace and the stamina and everything necessary that we know you will to get through these days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now to show how God does some, he, he's got this whole thing wired. This message tonight, for I'm concerned, I haven't preached a message that's important since I taught the rapture message for the first time. Am I going to give you a date tonight? Nope. That's not the message. So don't start waiting for that and miss the whole message. Right? I'm just saying as far as importance, this message ranks the same way tonight. And it's a turning point for our church or at a turning point in time, period. And to recap some of the things, we had a promise from God. October 11th, 1997. That God give a clear message out of his word. There were no signs, wonders, or miracles. It was a solid word message that anybody could go into God's word and examine it. You know, God doesn't deal with blind faith. He, he hates that. That's Satan's gift to the world. People say, you're a Christian, you just have, just have faith, and they go, this is like something special, blind faith. That's something stupid. Not God's faith. God always gives you what? Facts. Facts. That you can verify in his word and like sitting on a jury, they vote guilty or not guilty based on the facts. What you think, how you feel, has nothing to do with it. It's a, it's a decision you make based on what God said. Do I trust him to keep his word? And God give a track record you can check, check out. We're, in this, we're near 6,000 years now. So we've got the biggest advantage of everybody. We've got a track record of God for 5,900 years that we can check out. We're the last group. That's why God is not going to tolerate no faith from us because we can see the whole picture of what God's done, kept his word. Abraham, God made a promise to him. He said, how shall I know? What did God say? 430 years, you'll be slaves, right? The people will be saved, slaves and servants. What does that mean to Abraham? He would never see that. He died as 175 years old. And God gives an answer says, in 430 years, this is going to happen. But for those that came after Abraham's time, they could look back and see that one promise that God kept. And over time, they can see more and more, and God just stacks them up over and over again in his word. So he gets to the very end, he gives a message. Where? Out of his word and nothing else. He gives a message to a church, and he waits for a period of time where Satan has had a lot enough time to establish the truth that says, no, man know it. This is typical of Satan's interpretation of scripture. Everybody 
who knows this verse can quote that part of it. No man, no man. I would dare say most of us here could not quote the rest of that verse right. Some of us go as far as say the day and the hour. Okay? And that's where I would, at that point, if I was typing this, I would quit typing that point and go to my Bible and get the rest of it right. Because this is going to be wrong if I continue to type past that point. But Satan took a partial truth, no man knows the day or the hour, and told saints, and told the church, it's the rapture. Now we understand how he could do it. As God gave us some more history about the church. He said in the fourth church age, Jezebel did what? Leaven. Put leaven in the meal. Until what? The whole message of God was changed. Changed. This doctor started way back then in Jezebel's day. She's the one that taught that this is about the church. And so when we come along, a thousand or so years later, the church has, a, has had a thousand years of this truth from Satan. So then God gives a message from his word and you can verify. And the church has sat back and said, no man knoweth. They understand that they've rejected his word. Faith is our contact with God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Once that hearing and word contact is broken, salvation stops. The church never believed that message. Israel got to the promised land. God said, go into Jericho. What happened? They didn't believe it. There's giants there, right? Mm -hmm. At that moment, that congregation lost their faith in God's word. And that's why Paul makes a big deal in Corinthians. He says they were all baptized in the same way. They all received the Holy Ghost the same way. They all had the same truth, same spiritual meat, same spiritual drink, but God destroyed them all. That knocks out this eternal security once they've always saved. You are saved by faith in God's word. You stay saved by believing God's word as it comes to you. And at any point along the trip, at the very end, even when it's time to get the promise, you break down, it stops. And God says, I swore my wrath. He's mad. He says, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Again, Satan took that particular truth and said, well, they just missed Canaan. Canaan wasn't it. In Hebrews, it tells us that if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. God's talking about his eternal rest. He destroyed a whole congregation that day. He didn't kill them, but that day they were cut off from going in. Two men, Joshua and Caleb, believed it. Again, God told you numbers. You had a congregation of 600,000 men that came out of Egypt. Two held his word and believed his promise. Two. And God trashed 600,000. He's, he's serious about his word. He expected to be believed. And if it's not, there's nothing God can do with that person like that. Yeah. To say, I don't believe it, says, I know more than you do about it. I trust myself more than I trust you. And of course, what God does, he has the right to do it though. He's given a track record where he's come through 100% of the time. And on that track record, he has the right to make that last test tough. He tells these people, go into Jericho. A city, they said, we understand how literal this was now, walled up to heaven. They said, we were asked grasshoppers, and I thought that was like in a figure of speech. Now, God has shown us over the years how much of his word is just plain literal. And we read, read in Enoch how they said there were giants in that day 300 feet tall. Real giants. And they were then like grasshoppers, literally. That's terrifying to go something like that. And God says, you go into this city and take out these giants in the city. <laughs> it's just his word. He said, I'll be with you, and I'll drive them out before you. And he said, the men over to check it out. And they got over there and said, the land's everything God said it was. He always gives, every time, proof first of his word. He proves it. He lets you see it first. Give an illustration for us. This date came, as you all know, and went. And on October 12th, we were devastated, right? It was like a funeral in here. I didn't want to come out and preach. You all didn't want to come. And I sit here with some spaces that I hope I never see again, ever. Okay? That whole week, it was like someone had died in, in your family, all of us. There was no cheer, there was no laughter, there was nothing good at all. It was mm -hmm. the most nightmare thing I've ever been through. And then God comes along and gives a message. And that message was his proof message. Nothing else could resurrect a church, the whole church, in one day like that. And in one Sunday when God came through and told what happened and spoke his word, and we got that message, we were rejuvenated. And we were, we felt real good. We had a little bit more time. We didn't know how long. How long. I thought it was six months at that time. Or nobody could have told me it was going to be almost another three years. Okay? <laughs> After six months came and went, 
Then a year came and went. Then God started a whole new series of messages. You have need of patience. This was, he, t- he started this over a year after the rapture didn't happen. He starts giving a new message. So now at that point, it's okay, God's going to do something. Tell us something. Then we finally got to the end of that trip, sometime in July or so. And he gave us a great message that Sunday. He said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation to come upon all the world. Now, if, there's no, if there's any proof looking for of something that's about to happen in the whole world to everybody, that's the scripture. It's going to be such a devastating situation that God said, I myself will keep you from it. Okay? It's coming. It's like right around the corner. All right? So he gives us the patience. And then he says, your patience has ended. It's over. When that came, when that took place, I rejoiced that Sunday, but I also knew that now here goes a whole another thing unfolding. And that's when we had that message that God said, I spoke to you. Jesus said, I've been talking to you in Proverbs. Remember that sermon? Mm-hmm. He's just praying them all. He's recapping them all tonight. He said, and the apostles interrupted him. What did they say? No, Lord, thou speakest plain. We understand it clearly. They did the same thing we did. We contradicted God with what we thought. We're hearing messages from Jesus, at least in their day, and this message was clear to them. They understood him. He's speaking plainly. And Jesus said to me, he said, I'm not talking to you plainly. I've been talking to you in Proverbs. Now he's taking scriptures that we thought we knew so well. Those who are alive and remain. <clears throat> I thought we knew that. I thought I did. That was one of my main studies for the book. And then God comes along Sunday and lets us know that hey, that's not in there for the rapture. Although it talks about the rapture, that's in there lets you know that you are going to go through such a persecution and tribulation these last days that a lot of my church is going to get taken out literally. Understand something. It's a warfare. This is the most intense and real war there ever has been. It's been gone for some time, and now we are getting ready to enter into the fray. It's a simple situation God lays down. Believe my promise, go in, don't. You won't. Whosoever shall confess my name before men. That's your test in these last days. It's going to be, it's going to be, that's why God gets a message. Nobody falls between the cracks. He's going to put every one of us in a situation where you have to confess his name before men. Now, when you do that, it can result in injury or death, or you will have to run and escape. Bottom line, one of those three things will happen, okay? All the apostles died. We forget about that little detail. You know? He said, you should be witnesses unto me. The word is martyrs. And all those men had a rendezvous with death. In the scripture, I think I said St. John. Turn it for a minute. Leave James. Oh, that's where I wanted to start. So the Lord starts somewhere else. So. You know how that goes, don't you? The first church of scratched out notes. <laughs> All right. Look at this. St. John 21. This is the mystery God gave us that the rapture didn't happen. Told us why. Those guys back in that day, God made a promise to them. Jesus preached what to them? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So for 12 hours, when you go out and do what? Preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 12 apostles preach the same message. John the Baptist, same message, at hand. Somewhere in that time frame of that message of three and a half years being preached, God gave a date, exact day for it to happen. Then he showed us in the scriptures that he's outside Jerusalem, I'm ready to ride on, on the ass, and it says, because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Why do they think that? Why do they think, why do they think that? Because he told them. He said, this is the day that's going to happen. Zechariah prophesied, so the day it happens, the day the kingdom comes, your king will come riding in on the ass. That's your sign. Okay, he'll come riding on an ass. That day, Jesus came riding on the ass, did the kingdom come? No. Jesus canceled it that day because of their unbelief. We had no idea. We didn't know that was in the Bible. We didn't even know it. These men all preached the same message. Kingdom's at hand. Supposed to come. Didn't come. You know the story. Peter, he quit preaching. He quit. People say, well, you know, the kingdom of God is in your heart. Don't tell those men that. They knew that the kingdom was a literal kingdom with a literal king, and they were the cabinet. They were the, they were the what do you call it? The palace, whatever. Okay. They were the big wheels. And Jesus appears after his resurrection in the first meeting they have. 
They think he's going to talk about the kingdom. What does he do? It says he upbraided them for their unbelief. Imagine having a meeting of the, of the now they're excited enough. They were a for three days, crying and everything. He's dead, didn't believe he was going to die, gets him from the grave. Now we're having a meeting. I see it, they're just, they're ready. They've probably got there with the pens and pencils and Bibles. They're ready to go. Okay? <laughs> What's going to be my job? Will I be treasurer, secretary? You know? And he goes and tells them, he says, You guys won't believe nothing. What a donor meeting. He said, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets said to you. And you all didn't believe it. And this is then he opened up their understanding, they might understand the scripture and get a whole bunch more stuff. Right? Second meeting they have. Thomas missed the first one. They tell Thomas, look, if you'd have been there, the kingdom could have started. They feel like Thomas is to blame. Thomas is there next time. He's in the meeting. And that time Jesus appears and Thomas verifies that's the Christ or anything, my Lord, my God, and what happens? Jesus talks about something and leaves. No kingdom mentioned. That's when does Peter quit. This man quit because it was supposed to come on a specified date. The signs came from the Old Testament prophets. The date came and went. It didn't happen. He didn't explain to them either. Four days, after, four days after Pentecost, he hadn't told them what happened. He went and got Peter said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Remember that story? Love us on me? Peter said back, I like you, Lord. You're a great guy, but not enough for me to start keep on preaching again. I preached a message for three and a half years about a kingdom to come. I told my family about it, all my friends and everything, and nothing happened. I look like a fool. I like you. Second time, love us on me, Peter. Peter said, answer back, I like you. Third time, Jesus says, do you like me? Can you imagine if you're in that situation and Jesus come back to you and says, do you like me? Let's forget that. Do you just, do you just like me? And so that time, it grieved Peter because Jesus asked him, do you like me then? Since you're answering back, like me, do you like me? And that time, he told him, same time, feed my sheep. Now after that situation, we get in verse number 17. Let's pick it up there. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Now, this is the part I want you to see. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had thus spoken this, he says unto him, Follow me. Now this is the second call to follow him. He followed him for a while, and he quit. Now this next appeal to follow Jesus is made on what? The promise of you being crucified. He said, going to take you and bind you up and take you where you would us not. And Peter, was the apostle, they said was crucified upside down. He said, I, he said, I'm not worthy to, be very, to die like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And they did, gladly. Okay? Jesus told me, he says, he, after he tells me you're going to die preaching this gospel, follow me. Now he's following Jesus with an understanding now that I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. This is known. This is prophesied by Jesus. This is the Peter now who understands when Jesus speaks something's going to happen. You know, when he says you're going to deny me three times, Peter didn't believe that. Okay? Like we do, we believe some things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And some things God says, well, it might not. I can control it. Now we begin to hope, I hope we're beginning to understand that everything God is giving to us is going to happen. He means it. There's no options here like, or this doesn't really apply to me, or this applies to this brother. You've got to take the word now at this point and apply it to you, just you. Because God's talking to just you in the messages, all right? So he says, follow me, based upon this death. Jesus. I would go to Mark and give you a rundown on that one, but I won't. He started, it looks to me, around three to four months prior to his crucifixion to begin to teach his apostles that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and rise again the third day. Okay, <laughs> it says he began to teach this. He didn't preach it. Teach this to give details, explain something to his apostles. He sat down with them explained it very clearly, I'm going to get killed. And of course, what happened to them? You know, they, they didn't believe that. Later on, a few days later, a couple of weeks later, Mary, they had the Mount of Transfiguration episode. Peter, James, and John, the pillars of the apostles. They go up the mountain with him, and he's transformed, transfigured before them. They come out the mountain, and Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this until I'm risen from the dead. What do they say? It says, they ask themselves the question, what meaneth he by the resurrection of the dead? He just explained in the chapter before that. But they didn't believe that. They did not believe that anybody could kill Jesus, and, he's gonna, and furthermore, if they did, he wouldn't get up from the grave. Nobody did that before. They rejected that message. A kingdom's come. The Bible says a kingdom. How can you have a kingdom come if the king gets killed? That's their logic. 
That can happen. Human logic. We've learned also now that when God has said a message, he's going to make the whole thing work out. He told us that he gave us a scenario at the end, didn't he? And we prayed. We got real spiritual. <laughs> and prayed that God would hold that thing back. And I wasn't playing. Nobody else was playing. We were serious. We went out there held back as long as we could. And all of a sudden, October 10th came. And we just felt like that we were successful. We had conducted a <laughs> successful prayer campaign. <laughs> and then God came back to us October 12th and said, Oh, fools, little hearts, believe all I've spoken. Like, did you think those messages I gave was, was idle? You could just pray them away? He said, they're going to happen. There's some things you have no option to pray for. He said, they are going to happen. And so now, we get, now in this go around, we're going to see all the things that God gave us three years ago. Now we see how these, these, these things can and will happen. Now it has a whole different message to us, okay? He talked about his death every time, right down to the last part. Understand this. Look at your life and knowing, knowing, now you're, you're the son of God. You know you have a rendezvous with death. You know you're going to be killed. Abib, 14th, in the 33rd year of your life. You know that. Okay? You're living a life knowing, getting your head to together now in these last three or four months that my time is short. I'm going to get killed. Okay? Knowledge of that. All right? We're down to run that time frame now. Give or take a few. But it's time for us to go. And that's why God is now taking that message and he's intensified it now. This is the first time he's given us a clear message of what's going to really take place. We are the last bastion against Satan. He's upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Promise God made. He also said the Antichrist can't come until he, the body of Christ, is taken out of the way. How long do you think Satan's going to stand by idly and wait for us to get raptured? He's already, he sees God already being two years late. This was Satan's day too. He takes over then. The world is his. The Antichrist can come out. He's been held up for two years. We're upset when we didn't go out. You have no idea how upset that kingdom was. Because they know on that day, they, called, they put in their calendars, gone for us. And the earth is ours. And what does God do? He delays it. Then he gives a scripture in the back when he never knows in the Bible. What did he say? Though the promise tarry? Wait, what do you mean tarry? Watch yourself that before the fact. He's not do it that way. I'm expecting you to keep on following me. And I'm going to tell you so much, and you follow me, and then I turn a corner. But you can't see around. Then you follow me around the corner. And that's what he did, right? He put back there in Habakkuk, though it tarry. What? He said, wait for it. Wait for it. It's like the message he said, you need patience. Wait for it. Okay, Lord, well, when are you going to come next time? What did he tell us? He didn't. He didn't left us dangling since 97. He just said, wait for it. So I'm going to tell you, but wait for it. He told us yet, right? Uh -huh. Just says, wait for it. Then he asked Paul, his chief messenger to the church, pick up the same scripture from Habakkuk. What does Paul write? Though it, he that shall come, will come, will not tarry. So he's going to come on time. But he told us it's going to be delayed. Now, here's where these, this date and message really fits in. How do I know it was delayed? I have to have a reference point. A plane is late when it has a landing time. Come in at, what's coming at 8.05? 8.06 comes, that plane now is delayed. That flight's delayed. It's late. There has to be an established time. There has to be a date given first. And God did it. He put the message out. They let the message go by. How much of the church got turned off, you think, when that didn't happen? Remember what he said. He said, I'm going to take this church. I'm not trying to save the church. I'm going to take this church and throw it up. I'm a, I'm a, he says, this, this church has been waiting on my stomach and making me sick since it started in 1906, this, this last church. It's making it sicker and sicker. He said, there's nothing in Revelation to that church where God says, uh, get it together. He says, I'm going to spew this church out of my mouth. How's he going to do it? We had no idea. Then we begin to see how he's going to do it. He's going to give a word-only message to a church that is now deaf. Lost ear to hear. What a irony that is. You would have somebody gets deaf and then you start talking to him. And that's what God did. Why? They're deaf because they're not mine in the first place. And since they can't hear, I'm going to give a message they can't hear. And those who are still hearing my voice, they'll hear the message. The rest of the church, what about the ones who keep going to church every Sunday? They're not mine. They haven't heard my message. God said, I'm, I'm throwing him up. He's allowed the church to keep on going. 
Churches are growing. They got more programs going on time. They got, they're extending themselves and doing all kinds of stuff. He said, I'm at the door. Meaning what? I'm outside. And he said, if anybody in there hears my voice, I'll save you. But the church itself says, I'm going to damn this church. And people say, all these Christians going to church every Sunday. I'm going to understand now about 90% of them it's not his church. I was really upset, as you know, why the rapture mission didn't reach more churches. I couldn't stand that. Lord, well, you give a message that we don't have the means to put it out to the world. Okay? And there's all these churches never even heard this message. And God finally one day says, they're not mine. I didn't give it to them. And that was staggering to me. I didn't believe when God said that. I didn't believe it. I thought that was my imagination talking. This is my own thoughts talking. Now God has had time. That was about three years ago. God has time to verify the fact all these churches that aren't his. He showed us that he's been exposing one message for a long time now. What is it? Blessing? Prosperity. That's Satan's message. The church loves that message. That is the, that is the grand message. Every big name preacher at every convention center and so on and so forth in the arena, that's the message they're preaching. About being blessed. And you name it, claim it, God has some great things for you. Come on, get your miracle. That's the message. That comes straight from hell. What did God say? He said, he said you're going to know my message. Here's what I'm going to do in this last church. He said, those of you who I love, I'm going to rebuke you. I'm going to take this word and smack you with it every Sunday. He said, I'm going to take your lies and chasten you. I'm going to run your lives ragged. Those who I love. Now to the outside church, look, those folks look like the ones who are not blessed. They're the ones who I, the church is praying for to get blessed. And God said, I'm taking a church that's really mine that doesn't look like mine. And the church that looks like mine, it's not mine. Okay? So he's talking to a very small group of people. Now he's telling us this. How, are you gonna, how, how do you remain to the end? I'm going to tell you something. This is, this is really taking on a strange twist to me. Because Sunday morning, it hit me for the first time. Who wants to be here to the end? Yeah. That's the worst thing that could happen. Yeah. You know? We looked at the messy Sunday in Acts that they were scattered from persecution. They were running. Well, the lucky ones got taken out first. They were apprehended, told to deny his name. They didn't do it, and they were killed. Satan figures, if God ain't going to go and keep delaying his rapture, I'm going to take the church out. He knows every one of us. He knows who are the real troops of God. He knows his church because they're his members. Right. We're not his members. Right. So he knows us. Right. He knows every church not his members because the rest of them are his. Right. Okay? He ain't bothering his own members. <laughs> but he has us marked out. And he knows that if, he, if, he, if he's going to have his plans take place, he has to exterminate us. And that's going to be his order of business when this thing takes over and beginning in 2000. He plans to round us up and kill every single one of us. That's the plan. And that's what Jesus let us know that you are going to die. You're going to suffer persecution. Now, how do you stay around? Real simple. He's been giving us promises out of his word. Those who have the most information and believe God's word have the most faith. And you are going to overcome everything that's thrown against you. You have God's word to stand on and your faith. This, God needs the troops in the last days to the end who know the most of his word. Those who have been helped with skelter in getting his word, those who have hard to get his word at all, they're going to be the first ones to go. They'll get into heaven, but they're going to confess his name and die. That's how it's going to work. What did Jesus say? Whoever, whoever confesses my name before my father, I'll confess his name before the holy angels. But whosoever denieth my name, I'm going to deny his name before God. You mean I can be in church all my life is going to come out to this little thing here? Yeah, did it for Israel. They were there and there, got saved out of Egypt and went to the very end of the promised land. And it came out to one issue. Yesterday's faith, me walking with God for 5, 10, 20 years, doing kind of thing. God said, what do you do with my last message? Last one. Last message. Our trial is going to be identifying where we're at. Again, we're to, you're looking at a world, a hostile world takeover by Satan. Satan is called, this is his world. And God has allowed him and technology and everything else to come to a crescendo for this time. Satan has had 6,000 years to plan for a seven-year stint. Now let that soak in. 6,000 years of preparation for a seven-year run. All this stuff he's been doing and bringing out to face is for one small space and time for him to take over. That's it. Now he has it all together. Everything. And what's God going to do? God's going to let him display his stuff. He's going to let him work it. And he kept his church down here. He's going to come along. That's why, he had, that's why his message got the church hooked a long time ago, the non-church of God, on signs, wonders, miracles. You do a miracle show, you're going to pack a place out. 
every night. You've seen some of the charlatans who have people in, in, in certain seats and mark the seats and, you know, and have them come in wheelchairs and they ain't crippled and get them a walk. That kind of stuff is going on all the time. But Satan's got a little more sophisticated now. That game is over. He actually has been given the power by God to heal, to open up blind eyes, to make the lame walk. I before, I before it was all over here, we were to raise the dead. God's given that power. Because when the Antichrist comes, he's going to come working all signs and wonders and miracles. And so those who have been on this bandwagon in church all their lives, they have been on the cart that's pulling in the Antichrist. And when he comes, they'll be sitting ducks to be deceived by him because he's going to look like God to them. Now, that we know that God can't come or Jesus can't come until there's a tribulation first. So what's Satan going to do? He's going to bring about a tribulation. A fake one. That's why God, how many times has God taken us to 2 Thessalonians? Over and over and over and over and over again. I got tired after a while. And sometimes I came out here and I know that was a message and I hate to announce it to you. And finally I said, okay, turn to 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> I just said it, you know. <laughs> and you guys turned to it. And my, my problem was not repeating something. My problem and concern was that you feel like you've heard this already four or five times, eight or nine times for the last two years, not realizing that God is adding something more in it every time he's talking. Again, he lays on truth how? Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept, truth upon truth. It's not given one false swoop. God, he puts parts down, lays it down. And each time we went to Second Thessalonians, God laid a new part down every single time. Those who miss church in a period of time you have a broken line of faith that is subject to a breakdown at any point in time that's how it works those who hear it has, as he said if you continue my word now this scripture gets enlightened tonight he said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free from what what did you say? They said, what was the sign of your coming? He said, take heed that no man deceive. The truth will make you free from being deceived. It's going to be your salvation against the deception. What about those who don't know the truth? They're already deceived. They're already deceived. That's why that group in Matthew says, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name. And in your name we cast out devils. Demonic, what did he say? Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Interesting. You read in 2 Thessalonians. It says, for the mystery of iniquity that's already worked on the Antichrist. Now he tells this church, when he says, depart from me, you that work iniquity, the, the mystery of iniquity that's already working was the false church itself with the signs, wonders, miracles, blessing, prosperity. That was the mystery working already. And we had no idea that back in the 60s and 50s when things began to form out where it was heading to ultimately. It was a mystery at that point. And the church has just gone, oh, this, they want to see miracles. They want to see the power of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. If Jesus did these things, we got the power, we should be able to say, he never gave us the power for that reason. He gave us the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. as a way to enlighten us in God's word. He said, I'll give the Holy Ghost, he said, teach you all things. It wasn't made for you to cast on any devils or to heal anybody or to raise the dead. It was meant for you to have an understanding of God's word. He said, the Holy Ghost shall teach you all things. And he revealed things and bring things to your remembrance and teach you things to come. It's a teacher. And the church has made everything but that. They made it a you know, a power broker. It's, a, it's, it's the miracle worker. And you that wasn't God's message. Never was. And, but God allowed it to go out. Okay? Now he says, the end here, I'm going to do what? I'm going to send, he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to send this church a strong delusion. God doesn't have to be specific like that. All God does God do is I'm going to send it a, a delusion. A delusion from God. You know, somebody had that message. The prophet said that the Lord deceived me and I was deceived. Okay? <laughs> if God deludes you, you're going to be deluded. All you got to say, look, I'm going to trick you. And you're tricked. Right. Now, when God takes the time and says, I'm going to send them a strong delusion, he's serious. He's going to allow something to come. It's going to, be, it's going to seem perfect. And it's going to seem like him working. And it's going to take the people who have been believing in Jesus and delude them. They're going to fall for it. He said, I'm going to send them a strong delusion and the lie. I'm going to let a lie be told. And that lie, the Lord has showed us, is going to revolve around the reality and the existence of Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world and his Father, God the Father, being the one who sent him and created the world. That's, going to be, that's the lie. He gives a message up to that. Will the world creator please stand up? 
because you got some gods coming back down here who claim to be the creators that the world's been looking for for a long time, the Incas, the Mayas, American Indians, looking for a long time for these return of the gods. That's, that's the feather headdress or thing. These gods flew in the air and came down to them and promised to return again. They said, we are your creators. We made you. We formed your DNA. You're ours. And they're coming back again. And all these different religions have been looking for the return of these gods. They're coming. They said, we know them now as aliens. Coming back down again. Satan, again, if God has a kingdom with a numerable number of angels and people and prophets and all kind of other stuff, Satan has the same thing. Uh -huh. We've never seen his kingdom. Right. He's going to make it visible, though. No, no, he's going to bring his kingdom down. It's takeover time. It's, take it's going to be a battle fought over the earth. But he can't do a thing until we're out the way because we hold him back. He cannot bring his antichrist into show because the church, you are the salt of the earth. You're preserving the earth right now. Once you're gone, all hell breaks loose. So what's Satan going to do? Look, guy, you ain't giving a date, and they're holding my place. He knows he's got a short time. He's panicking. When God first gave the revelation, go back with me for a minute now, follow this. When God first gave the revelation, he starts with 1997, October. All right? Then, 99, he showed us, would be the first year of the tribulation. We're there. No tribulation happened yet. 2000, second year, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 2005, y'all be over. That was God's message. Satan knows he has until 2005. God ain't changed something yet. He knows as well as we do that's supposed to be the date. And we're still here. And he's looking at, that's why it says he come, he's coming from heaven knowing he has a short time. He's coming like a, raving, like a roaring lion because He's going to come down with a, with a calendar in mind. And his calendar has been messed up already for two years now. He's been delayed. He's been held back. He intended to be fully underway by now. And he's not. So what's he going to do? He's going to make it happen. Take heed, brethren, even not soon shaking in mind, no trouble. He's going to bring about a shaking. He's going to reactivate volcanoes. They can do that now. These, I, mean, I keep meaning to bring out that report from Turkey and read you the actual account of that of that uh, earthquake there. There's never been an earthquake account like that anywhere in the world. Particularly that man talks about the, the whole ocean drained. Mm -hmm. And they saw in the ships and they said before that happened they said a bunch of fish came up. He said they're like they have been fried. Okay? We know now they're zapping things off from the sun. We never thought about that kind of stuff before. That guy gives us a script. What do you say? The sun shall not smite thee by day. Now what in the world is that talking about? The sun I thought was made by God for us. Yeah it is. But Satan and his devilish deeds he's doing, he is operating from the sun. To do what? To smite the earth. And you. He intends to zap you out. And God said, won't smite you by day. He said, and neither will the sun smite the moon. They're trying to nudge the moon out of its orbit and change things around. They're going to light up Jupiter, as you know, make it a star. Okay? These things men intend to do. And that's why God tells us, again on the message Sunday, no, this is the last day, he said, what? Perilous time. That's the every time I hear that. He said there's going to come a time before the church, just before the church leaves here, there's going to be a time of unprecedented peril. And that's when St. Lawrence is attacked. Okay, church still here, got to give a date, I'm going to take it out. He's going to try to do that. But there's going to be some certain people like yourselves who have heard all of God's word and believed it. And you're going to be his biggest thorn. And God said, what he says, I'm going to allow you to work wonders and miracles. You have to work them not to be getting no notoriety. You ain't going to be that kind of party. You got to work them for your survival. You know, you're going to be able to have the power. He gave us a message again out, out, of, out of John about the wedding of Cana. And he said, he said, the best wine for last. And it says, how much more will the Father give the Spirit to those who, what is he talking about? I'm talking about an end time giving of a better wine. And those who are in the last days, he says, I'm going to give you a power to call upon my Spirit. I'm going to give you a blank check to things you've never done before. Not, again, to get a reputation or to build a church, but to just make it that time. He's going to give that power to do it. He gave something to me tonight also when I was pulling the driveway. Well, you know, the size of this church has bothered me since day one. It quit after a while, but it's bothered me for a long time. When God gave the rapture message, he consoled me in the sense, he said that when he gave that message, when Christ was born, okay, he went to shepherds. 
This would be a message you think would be announced in Jerusalem in the temple. So he went to shepherds on the hillside at night, watching their fox. What's interesting are those shepherds, not one name's mentioned. We don't have idea how many there are. We know they're blue collar workers of the extreme sort. They heard the message that said, let us now even go to Jerusalem and see things come to pass. Bethlehem, they went. They got and went. But he talked to the least likely group about the birth of the Savior. They didn't go out and turn the world upside down. But I'm sure everybody saw They said, look, we saw the king. We saw the Messiah. How many folks believe these guys? They probably wonder, and it's private, I'm sure they told some of the priests. And the priests told me, said, look, if the Christ had been born, we know. And that particular rumor got squelched by the church right now. These are some shepherds running around here outside Jerusalem talking about they saw you know, the, the, the child and angels. That's just a lie. They got condemned. But those, some of those same shepherds were around 30 years later when the Messiah came. And some of those shepherds got a chance to shake Jesus' hand and say, we saw you in the manger. And their faith really bolstered them. And he, and he confirmed it to them. But a no-name group. Well, that's one thing that God gave us. Then he gave me something else tonight. He said he called 12 apostles. And it says, these 12 men in Acts, says, have turned the world upside down. Got to tonight, he says, he said, what you have in that church, and what I've called out and given my word to, he said, I've saved enough people there to have an effect on the world. He said, that's all I need. He's been talking for some time. We've been known for some time. The message we've been getting here have not been, they have not been going on anyplace else. The church on the East Coast, they got the closest thing to it, but not all of it. Because this guy's still holding on to some of the things that he'll let go. I haven't written to him yet, okay? But he's giving you everything. If anybody ought to make it, it'll be you. If anybody's going to be around, alive and remain, it's going to be you. And why would he have to take you up in a moment, twinkle of an eye? Because at that last moment, the entire group is alive and remain. Satan has finally figured out a plan to take you all out at once. And just when he shoots his whatever it is, it's going to take us all out, God's going to come and rapture you out. And he's going to prove his, keep his promise. But it won't be the whole church of stars. Most of them going to get slaughtered. But it's nothing new. It's been happening in the church for a long time. Now we're going to start the scripture that God gave that said the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. Right straight through. But he said what? But the violent take it by force. It says every man presses his way in. Nobody's going to listen to glide along the old big road and go to heaven. The church made us think for a long time that, you know, when we all get to heaven, we'll just, you know, by and by in the morning, all those nice songs. And just one day we're going to get caught up. God says it's not, it doesn't happen that way. Israel came out of Egypt at, at nighttime. It's scary. God's going the wrong direction. It takes them out to the sea, in between the canyons, and then stops. And then it stops. And then goes back to Egypt and tells Pharaoh, they're stuck down there. Go get them. <laughs> now they're pinned in. In the dark, everything's worse at nighttime. The night of their deliverance from Egypt was not a sane, joy situation. It was a night of terror. Stark, raving terror. Pictures of out there in the dark. You have no weapons, no nothing. You just got delivered. You can't cross the Red Sea. You got like a grand can on both sides of you. And now you hear these horses coming, thundering in the night, coming towards you. Ain't about to get back to slavery. They're killing you now. Pharaoh has nothing to lose. He lost his firstborn son. So the rest of the, uh, the land of Egypt, they're coming to kill you. And God sent them. He said, well, your deliverance is going to be done by me. Then the last minute, what does he do? He opens the Red Sea. And they escape. It's, the same, it's, a, it's a prototype of our salvation. He's going to allow us to be put into a tight spot. He's going to allow Satan to identify us and come all, all at one time. He has to get rid of the church. He knows that. He has to take us all out. And this when that time comes, it's going to look like we're all hope is lost. And God's going to come in and snatch us out. That's the scenario. It's not been the rapture of the church been preached all these years like this. One day, who knows when, life is going to go on as usual. And then one day, we just fly away. Just know that we're going to go through some stuff and get out of here. Again, Paul said, I might know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Right? Jesus preached the message. He said, Amen, my disciple, do what? Take up his cross. All Jesus promised was a cross. What's that? Suffering and persecution. He promised that. Jesus never said, come to me and get blessed. Come to me and prosper. Come to me and get a better job. Come to me and get a better house. Come to me and get a better... He didn't, he didn't preach that. He says, come and follow me and they're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. You should be persecuted from city to city. You're going to suffer. And what does Satan do? Gradually took that message of suffering and persecution and faded it out and replaced it with blessing and prosperity. You can't have 
two messages run together. Either you're suffering and persecuted or you're blessed and prospered. Not to me, I know some of you know, I don't know too many, but there's a lot of rich folks in Beverly Hills tonight. They're not suffering. Not at all. <laughs> They're not really suffering. If that one car breaks down tomorrow, <laughs> it's not going to bother them how to get it fixed. They have to get it fixed tomorrow to get the other one. Or the other one. Price no object, just take you know, this, to have the car towed in. They won't wonder about, you know what, let's see, what, what, what are we going to not eat this week? <laughs> There's a different level of suffering there. You see know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Satan gives us the message of the whole church. Come and follow Jesus, and your life's going to become blessed. Jesus became a Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Just call him up and tell him what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and he's supposed to do it. <laughs> Satan gives, he, he writes the songs for the church. He writes the songs to fit his message. And certain songs are born. And they capture them like wildfire across the whole nation. Love for the word. Second church age, Satan's seat. Third church age, Satan's synagogue. Fourth church age, leaven. Fifth church age, says dead. He told us about the wheat and the tares. There's my wheat, then Satan came along and planted tares. Look like saints. They can outwork you any day. They don't cuss, they don't drink, they don't do anything wrong. They are legalists to the bone. They make you look like a real sorry Christian. And God said they're tares. Is Satan put in the church. They're make-believe saints. And when those, those guys saw they said, what should we do, Lord? Should we go gather? He said, no, let, let them stay there. Let the tares and we go up together to the end. They've been together in the church since the second church age. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, on the average field in the church right now, you get about this percentage, wheat, rest tares. And God made it pretty clear. He said, what? He made a promise. Where two or three are gathered together, my name. Now, again, it's the one that's kind of scripture. We think that God's just being like talking to kind of a, you know, Metaphoric way. Ah, he meant that just that. <laughs> in the typical congregation, there's going to be two or three of mine, and the rest tears. It is Satan's church. And those two or three are going to be oddballs. And that's when he opens the door and knocks the door. He says, if any man will hear my voice, he's talking to those two or three. Right. And he pulls about two or three out of the churches. And then he closes the door. And he's through. We experience that first time. We experience God opening the door of a church and calling some out. Yeah. Who are hearing his yeah. voice, who are frustrated. Who are looking at scriptures that did not make sense. Listen, the doctrines that just didn't go together, and they were and they're, they're, they're gandy dancing, is making you think that you were not even spiritual to even ask the question. And after a while, you know, the Lord said, hey, come on. He had a message of a rapture. And you came out expecting to be gone in six months. <laughs> then God tricked you, huh? And you know what happened. And then God started making your life miserable. And this guy that you were excited about back in April, 97 or so and so forth, he became loathsome to you. <laughs> This manna. <laughs> and going to church all of a sudden got to be a drag. It got to be hard. And all of a sudden, God, the rapture went, God explained why it went, and then said no more about it. And went on a whole different trip. And started talking about other stuff. Right? And started, started going other directions. And so he said, well, you know, I'm not sure if I believe that or not. You know, he didn't care. He just kept on going and kept on giving it to you. Now it comes to the end, now he's wrapping everything up. But he's been turning all along and says, you better believe what I'm saying to you. Because it's all going to happen. He's giving us bits and pieces, and we've got the whole scenario. The last thing he's giving us now is death. Okay? Now, <laughs> that's not the message at all. That was preliminary, okay? That I had not planned to say. The message tonight is from James. Now, that, when I saw that, that, that did it for me. God spends all this time showing us, and for those who don't know tonight, I'm going to tell you this. You're going to gag, but that's okay. You can talk to anybody else here they, who have the teaching. They can tell you. Verify it. God called 12 apostles. One guy named Judas betrayed him, hung himself. God replaced him. A man named Paul. The church had an election. They voted another guy in. They voted a guy named Matthias. Okay? His name is mentioned in that one chapter. No more. That was the people's choice. God made it very clear from that illustration. He said, I run this church. They can vote if they want to. He doesn't recognize their vote. He said, I walk in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. He still operates in his church today. He says, I hold the seven stars in my right hand. I still talk in my church. And they can get together and have a vote like they did. And God, you know, let them vote. They come with us an apostle. But this is one that God put in. That's why Paul's wife saying, am I not an apostle? One born out of due season. 
then study under Christ, then walk with the other apostles. Paul was a, a thorn in their flesh. You know, here's this man talking about, he brings a doctrine out one day, says, we want to all sleep. Now the person most likely to bring that doctrine would be Peter. And had the keys of the kingdom, one of the first ones, original ones. John, James, one of those three. And God has one born on due season, and so let's get right this down. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now we know what a mystery is, from the Greek word mysterion. This means what? To cover the mouth. <coughs> now Paul says, I'm going to take something that God kept his mouth covered on all these years. He says, I'm going to tell you. Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Now, how do you think the other apostles took that message? Not too happy. Okay, Paul, prove it. I ain't got no proof. This was a straight out revelation that God gave me. And the church has been preaching about the rapture based upon the revelation Paul, God gave Paul. Then God told Paul, he said, what's going to happen, Paul? And God said, at the last trump. That's been a record since 64 AD. And the church had no idea what the last trump was for almost 2,000 years. Then God comes along near the end of time then and reveals the last trump to a church that doesn't have an ear to hear. He breaks it down. And in doing so, he gives us understanding of his 50-year cycle for the first time and lays on all the dates. When Christ is born, when he died, all, everything falls together like a road map. This is perfect. Whole scenario. Not just a date for the rapture, but a date for everything that Jewish scholars and, and great church leaders have never understood. They've been debating for years about the birth of Christ a year. 4 BC, 3 BC, 2 BC, all kind of years. Is that up for debate? When he put things in order and laid things out with his revelation, he gave the exact years and put things down. In his, there's some stuff there in that book I never knew. I never heard preached before at all until God gave it. Then he had the mockers and the scoffers who were so dumb and so I was like, what is Steve's message? Steve ain't that smart <laughs> at all. <laughs> Particularly when you got a message that people ain't believing and it's causing you a lot of problems, what fool will keep preaching it? What do you have to gain? Just kind of quietly drop the message. <laughs> tip, away, tip away from it, like the church did. Let it go. And preach something else. Because this ain't working. Folks <laughs> like this message. Because so they know no man over there, they are. <laughs> Full church, they you know, kind of tip away from it. Right? <laughs> and they understand, they tipped away from it, they were tipping it to death. <laughs> they still get together every Sunday. And they raise their hands to Jesus, and they clap, and the Spirit of the Lord, no, he's not. And that's what you have to understand. Jesus says, take heed that no man, he says, I'm going to send them a strong delusion. They're going to thank God there he's not. Saints have been playing this for a long time. Go into any church, hmm. Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, they all feel like church. They all got their own different kind of music and everything. But it feels like church. There's a feeling you get when you go in. It feels religious. Satan was the music minister in heaven. He can create music for any kind of mood. And he does. But church music is his specialty. He wants to be worshipped like God. He says, I'm going to be like God. He specializes in church music. He specializes in church, period. That's why he gets so mad sometimes, you know. If we were as faithful to church as Satan was, we'd have a lot less problems. He don't miss. He doesn't miss. He's there early. He's filled the seat up early. And he watched you as you come in and tries his best. With his, I'm not saying him particularly, but his little imps and demons. Their job is to get you upset before you leave home to come to church. They start some confusion at that point. Their goal is not to let you get there. So you say, I'm going anyhow. So you get in the freeway. And now, of all nights, these lanes are closed night. And it's the, the logical or the, the, the human thing to do is say, yeah, this is just, you know, we're not getting nowhere. Let's go back home. By the time we get there, it's going to be too late. Right. And then it's about the time it's about ready to do that. You're open now. And you, well, we're going to make it. Time to go to church, you start, getting, you start feeling bad. Those aren't just coincidences. You're in a warfare. His object is to keep you away from that word. And you've been pressing out and getting it. Because Jesus says, continue my word. If you do that, you're my disciples indeed. And here's my promise. I will make sure you know the truth. You can be deceived. I'm going to tell you everything. I spoke to you in Proverbs, and I'm going to, get to talk to you clearly what's going to happen. He's going to give us some clear messages about what's going to happen. And he ain't done yet. He's not even gotten started yet, really. The clarity that God's going to bring us now in the next few weeks is going to be mind-boggling. You have to understand this, too. I'm not up here with a warehouse full of knowledge and a storehouse full of knowledge. Okay? I'm where you're at. I get that message when you get that Sunday. And at that point, that's all I know. 
And that's all I had, that's all I hear. I'm getting my faith for this stuff the same time you get it. Some stuff, most of the messages, I'm getting it as I'm preaching it. And if I was just beginning to preach, or been preaching for five or ten years, I'd be stopping every few words and I couldn't preach because I have to check this out first and I haven't checked out, I haven't, I haven't studied this stuff. The Lord is talking. He's fixing sometimes so I can't even have, don't have time to study. He's worked that way so all you got to do is time, come in here and I start talking. It's happened to me times. I know that. Now there's the scripture, James. Let's get that before it's time to go home. <laughs> you miss it. <laughs> There's some things I want to say for a long time, and sometimes the Lord gives you a chance to say them. Okay? And tonight, it's one of those special nights that God gives a chance to say some, some things, and it's for all of us, okay? James chapter... I don't know yet. It's in James, by the way. Though. I was talking about James, wasn't I? The apostles got lost. There were two apostles named James. One was called James the Less. Neither of those are this guy. This James here is the half-brother of Jesus. All right? He's the same person we find pastoring the church in Jerusalem. Now, the person who should have been pastoring the church is Peter. Remember that big meeting they had in the 15th chapter of Jerusalem about circumcision? And when they're all said and done, the last speaker was James. James says, brother, men and brother, my sentence is this. James... How did he get to be pastor of that Jerusalem church and how did he get to be an apostle? Well, his brother Jude tells us. The next book of Jude says, for certain ungodly men crept in unawares. How did he get to be bishop of the church in Jerusalem? Jesus' half-brother, good enough. <laughs> if very clear in the scriptures, his family didn't follow him. They came to take him home and tell him, say he's beside himself, he's mad. His brothers, what do he say? These are my mother and brothers, right here. Okay? They didn't follow Jesus. And now a man who didn't follow Jesus is head of the mother church in Jerusalem as a pastor. And is called an apostle. Okay? Now God has given a message on James some time ago. James was a legalist. He preached a, a do and don't message. And the church likes James' message because it makes us feel good. We can pat ourselves on the back and say, I. It's no difference somebody who quit smoking by themselves. A person who does that feels good. A person who loses weight feels good. Your self-esteem goes up. Your self-confidence is boosted. Right? I'm talking about sinners that every time without the Holy Ghost, you know, nothing, they change. They've accomplished something. Willpower, so on and so forth, right? So, Satan grabbed that message and seized it. When the law was in vogue, nobody was keeping the law. And then when God abolished the law and made grace, Satan established the law. <laughs> now, as church is preaching do's and don'ts. So you go to church. You ask somebody, what's a Christian? They say, well, a Christian is somebody who does this, don't do that, goes here, is do's and don'ts. <coughs> and a lot of people say, well, I don't want to be a Christian. Not yet. <laughs> you know, when I get to be about 90 years old and ready to die and can't do anything else, then I'll go get saved. Right. Made sense to me. Right. Okay? Right. Then we kind of find out that the Lord showed us that it's of grace. It's a gift. Right. Not of works. That's the man should boast. So on and so forth. Well, James did not preach this message. Now, after God spent all this time talking to us about James, well, he didn't preach. But this message tonight, he takes the text from James. And right away when that text came up, I said, well, I'll look at it. I said, you're talking about speaking in Proverbs, and I'm speaking plainly. Look, look at this. <laughs> chapter, I ain't found a chapter yet. Hold on. I'm going to find it. Don't worry. Chapter, last chapter. Chapter last. <laughs> Chapter last. <laughs> Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction. Now, this is the word the Lord really spoke. Like, God can say a whole lot. I understand a little bit how heaven's going to be like as far as time is concerned. So I'm driving home. And God gives a message that could take about two hours to preach, and he gives a message in about two minutes. It's a miracle to me. He says a whole lot, and it's a short period of time. And all of a sudden, you got a whole message you can't even get out. You're sure in two hours that God spoke in about two minutes. Okay? And God started here. Okay? He talks about the prophets. This is from James. Who spoke in the name of the Lord. For an example of 
suffering, affliction. Now, I thought that the suffering and affliction was going to be spoken in the name of the Lord. Not at all. God took all these prophets he called and afflicted them. He gave them all an affliction. And there is various prophets. I'm going to show you something on God's word. It's going to be exciting. Okay, look at something. Verse number. Now let's start verse number 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now here's a scripture, again, where God allowed to get in. He allowed James to write some scripture in that he wanted in. Like he allowed Balaam to prophesy some things about Israel that were true. But Balaam was a false prophet. Okay? True words here. But God also told us something. What did he say? In these last days, I'm not going to be in this business. Healing. We got some folks in church I've been praying for. Every time I see them in the same situation, I'm, I'm grieved. And I'm questioning myself. I'm wondering what's up. Until God lets know that Satan's doing all these things nowadays. He's doing them all. He said, I'm out the arena. He said, so close to me. He said, those of you who have any kind of flicks, I'm going to take you home. You're going to get healed, complete the brand new bodies. He's not doing that right now. And I'm going to tell you, that was one of the hardest things for me to preach. Because that was just hard to believe. Mm -hmm. That God's not doing that. So the Lord spoke to me and says, let me ask you this. And he said, do you believe I'm giving your church the truth? I said, yeah. He said, how many have I healed? He said, any healing is going to take place, it'll be here. So he's doing it. He said, I would heal him here where my word's going for. He said, I haven't healed anybody there. He said, every healing taking place, all of them are not, none of them are mine. And that was, took me a long time to digest. I said, you mean, no, no. he said, none of them. I'm not doing that. He does not expect to sit around and wonder if this guy doing or saying doing it. The guy said, I'm out of that business. Those of you who are sick, I'm going to keep you going along, and I'm going to change you pretty soon and give you whole new bodies. I don't want to give Satan any advantage. Those are mine. Everybody getting healed is not, is not here. That's right. All of them. That's, I know that's hard to take right now, but, you know, it's gone. Then he says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly, may not rain, and it rain not on the earth by the space of three years. Now, here's what he's saying. We've heard this all before, the scripture many times, old passage, but it ain't old. It's from right now. Elijah was a man of like passions. I mean, he liked what you like. He liked to eat every day. Okay? Now, here's what happened. Here's how God works. I said, he gives, he gives these guys an affliction, either by the word itself or with the word. I'm sure you're both of them tonight. Elijah, God told Israel, he says, when you go into Canaan and you get there and start worshiping strange gods, he said, I'm going to rebuke you, punish you. And one of the things he mentioned, I'm going to close the windows of heaven and withhold the rain from you. They got to Egypt, worshiping false gods, and for quite a long time. Kept on raining. And then God called his prophet, Elijah, and took this scripture and put it in front of his face, like a stumbling block. Elijah read it. He read the scripture and knew that God had not done this. But who wants it not to rain for three and a half years? Nobody. I mean, you're talking about famine, mm -hmm. major famine. He's a man like you. He don't want that. But God stuck in his road and said, I made a promise I was going to do. I haven't done it. And God made it his problem. And Elijah was trying to preach around it and get around it, and God kept putting that scripture in front of him. So finally, Elijah, because of that scripture, he praised the Lord earnestly. Don't mean he prays a long time and prayed for hard. Earnestly means that he looked at this scripture here, looked at the fact of God's word, and prayed on that fact. And said, Lord, okay, then stop the run, stop rain for three and a half years. He, he gave the time frame. God didn't give it. God said, I'm going to do it. Elijah prayed for three and a half years, the time frame, and God stopped the rain. Now, this affected Elijah's life, too. He don't eat no more, okay? What prophet would do that that wasn't called by God? I mean, I can see putting some people in misery, but not me. <laughs> if I, and if I, got, if I got to pay, then nobody's going to go to this because I'm not going to deal with this. You know, I want to eat, too. He prayed. And no rain came for 20 years. And this man is like, he's a prophet. 
this one is to get the stories about God sent him over by a brook. And a raven came and fed him. He had the water, and the raven brought him food every day. And after a while, like we do many times, start ready to start looking at the miracle instead of the God who provides the miracle. We start looking at the raven. Oh, what a great miracle here. And the water. So what did God do? With no rain for three and a half years, his brook got smaller and smaller. You got there every day, so you see this brook getting becoming a trickle. And know that this is my only source of water. And it's getting smaller on something I prayed. Okay? And the raven stopped coming. And Jezebel, meanwhile, is after you to kill you. Okay? Now, let me go to the final one. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. Let me just highlight something real fast. Isaiah. Imagine being this guy's church. The guy said, go outside and lay on your right side for 180 days and eat dung. <laughs> dung cakes. They make, make you cakes of dung and eat them. <laughs> now, you see this guy and you know that this man here, Isaiah, has lost his mind. <laughs> he may have been a preacher of God at one time, but he's lost it. He then went off in the deep end and God, you know, he's, he's taking the spirit from him and look at him, he's nuts now. <laughs> now God's going to do this. Then your side for 180 days on your right side and eat dung. And then after the says, at the end of those days, God said, now turn over your left side. You pass by this guy going to work for one year. And this is what he's eating to lay on his side. And God is prophesying through him. His church is probably one or two, zero. Who's going to believe him? Almost going to believe him are those who are hearing God's voice. And the rest of the church in that day, they didn't believe him. And why, why did God do that? For that reason. He puts his word above everything. It will go through some dramatic things to make it heard. Never with the intent of trying to get more people, God puts the word out with the intent of only getting those who hear it. He spreads them out all the time. Another prophet, God told him to walk backwards. I didn't check that one out before I came out because the time was too short, but he was supposed to walk backwards for a period of days. Another guy was the head of walking around with no clothes on for six months, naked. He tells another prophet, Hosea. This one I never understood too much. Too, you know, here's the thing about it. We see God give these guys, t tell these guys something. We think that you know, they heard the voice of God and then ran out and did it. He tells Hosea, he says, you go out and marry, take a wife of whoredoms. Okay? Now he didn't get that message from God and then go out you know, to the red light district and <laughs> look and see which one God's going to light up, okay? It didn't happen that way. In the natural daily flow of his life, he met a whore and fell in love with her and knew she was a whore then he married her. Okay? And God had him fall deep in love with her. And right after the wedding, she leaves and starts her whoredoms again. And a few, a few weeks later, comes home, pregnant. It's your wife who you love, okay? That God caused you to fall in love with her over a, it will seem a natural chain of events. First kid, God said, name his name, Lo am I, meaning not my people. <laughs> now, she come with a kid, this man loves this woman, but she got a kid that's not his. This is, this is not a story, this is this man's life. He was the most miserable person in the world. In love with her forever, and she was a whore forever. <laughs> Leaves again. She's gone for a few, a few weeks. Comes back home. Okay? She's pregnant again. God says, name this kid Lo Rahama, meaning not your God. He's preaching a message, but it, the message would understand, but he used a man's real life to do it. And this man lived a whole lifetime in the bitterness of this situation that God put him in to get a message out. Okay? See what I'm saying? He's been doing that. Here's the one that God opened up tonight for the first time for me. I, I remember when I was preaching on Homer Sam that I talked about Noah. I said, we know nothing about Noah. There's very little about Noah in the Bible. We don't know. We, all I know is the guy, he's the guy who built the boat and preached, right? <laughs> God sometimes just pulls the curtain back just a little bit to give you a glimpse, and then he reveals it. Now, this curtain has been pulled back a long time, okay? Noah became after a flood a husband man, a wine grower. <laughs> and he drank, it says, of the grapes and got drunk. Now, the people that was drinking a lot in the Bible, from what I can see it is, drunk in the same. And Noah, after the flood, gets drunk. I mean, drunk, passed out kind. 
You know what God revealed for the first time? He revealed that this was not Noah's first trip to the drunk. <laughs> Noah either was an alcoholic or became one after God called him to preach the message. <laughs> okay? Everything about it. Looking at Noah, they're saying, look, Noah, who's going to believe you? This old guy's lost it. Okay, right? I mean, think about that. God picked this guy because he knew nobody's going to believe him. And he didn't want this war. He's going to destroy it. So he, preached the he picked the messenger that nobody would believe his message. Oh, crazy Noah lost it. But there's something else in the story. He had three sons, their three wives, and his wife. Seven people. I'm just beginning to understand and get a respect for Noah's family. Noah's family stuck with Noah preaching his message. They didn't know it was a prophet. They knew that. Okay? I look at my family tonight, and I got some girls here who shouldn't be here at all. I watched Satan bring our family to the brink of just to totally destroying it. To a point where I can say to the guy, I said, Lord, you have to just fix this. Can't do a thing about it. And I seen God do that. You know, sometimes we, we talk about prayer for people. Like this week, if you were anybody on the internet and you haven't seen me click on, Robert, you know, Steve's logged on, he hasn't logged on this week. Anybody emailed me this week, you haven't gotten any, okay? Well, you don't hear from me, you pray for me. All right? I'm not in a, a vacuum and then come out and do warfare on Sunday and Wednesday. I'm going to stray through and have been in it for some time. And like I said, with Hosea, God will take your life and just weave it into a situation, and that's it. Without which, Noah could have never preached that message like it is. Because Noah knows himself as being this drunk, preaching a message from God, that nobody believes, how much harder did he preach it? To get across. God spoke to Noah one time. You know that? And no more. And Noah, one time here from God, preached a message for 120 years. And his family had to get the faith in that message to actually go out there with him and build his boat. And they did. Okay? You know, sometimes, and this has come to me, sometimes, you know, Shelly come out and talk to you, all right? She's not a preacher. She doesn't claim to be called anything else. I asked Shelly six, seven years ago, maybe longer than that, to do song service. Which those of you who know, know her voice, okay? <laughs> worst thing in the world I've done. All right? The reason I ask is because I knew I had somebody I could say, I want these songs on this Sunday, I want to get no flag. Mm -hmm. All right? I know about song leaders and church choirs and all that kind of stuff. I told her to have her do it. And she would be so pitiful and so embarrassed to get up every Sunday, you know, but she did it. You know, and feel like a fool, right? And doing any kind of thing for the Lord, after a while you start getting, you start changing. You don't pray the same you did when you first start praying. When you first start praying, you're too nervous even to start really pray. But now it's a little bit different now. Now you got a prayer to pray. Now there's a burden, there's a feeling, there's a message that goes with it. Now it's praying from the heart. You don't care what you sound like anymore. Now it's, it's a fervent, effectual prayer now. You're in the song service. You know, one time it's like, well, what are we going to sing Sunday? Now you got a you're coming up here on Sunday with a message in the song. You're trying to put out a message based on the message that's being preached. It's a burden now. You know, so it's not just like, well, I'm going to pick these songs and that's it. You're thinking about songs all week long. And sometimes you'll say, can I, I'd like to talk to the church a little bit this morning, you know? I said, okay. I used to ask what you're going to say, you know? Screen out everything. The Lord told me, he said, I've answered a prayer of yours. This is my prayer. When I used to assist my dad, I was the best assistant my dad could have ever had. Then when I knew God's word, I preached God's word, and I never eclipsed him. And even in the message where he was off, I never caused a, a, a split in his church or a problem in his church when he was gone by bringing up something he taught something different. I stayed quiet on the subject. And it's moved around him. And he was always in his absence, most like, you know, like Aaron did. He built a golden cap in Moses' absence. That's typical work of an assistant pastor, okay? Most pastors have a church with assistants. They have some time during their career of pastor, they got to come back and straighten out some major mess that the assistant makes, okay? okay? In nine and a half years, he never had to come back one time and correct anything. It's, it's one of the few churches that he could be gone and the, the attendance and the offering would be exactly the same as if he was there. And I prayed once and I said, Lord, because I was always thinking about pastoring church one day, I said, Lord, forever get to be a pastor Give me an assistant like you've given to him. Okay? I didn't know that was it. 
because she's not she ain't a preacher. Okay, and to me, it had to be a preacher, all right? But I've had, I've, been, I've been able to watch her over the years to grow, and she comes out now like a church mother, okay? For real. And what I've seen though is not it's not making an appearance on Sunday and doing this little you know spill. I watch her all week. I watch about the things she goes through during the week. Being a mother, being my wife, and then being concerned, the Lord put a burden on her heart for spiritual children. And when she comes to talk to you, she's talking from the heart. It's for real. And We've been in a family that God, like I said in, 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 jo in James, it says that these, let me read it again. I'm going to say it wrong. James 5. Was it 5? Yeah, okay, 5 and 10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction. Here's what God did with all of them. Didn't know this. Remember we read about Jeremiah that Sunday in Lamentations? You remember that story? I mean, I couldn't get over it. I thought Jeremiah and God were like this. And Jeremiah started talking about what the Lord did to him. And what, how God messed up his whole life. And God allowed this to go wrong and so forth, okay? He said, I forgot certain things. He said, there's this gone. This is not this guy picked. And then just like, it wasn't like the guy said, okay, you're going to do this. And then all of a sudden he goes on and starts tearing down, building and destroying. Through a natural course of events in life, this is where his ministry took him. All right? The affliction, he gave him affliction. Now, here's, here's, here's the thing about it. God gives them affliction, and they are to preach and be patient, preaching God's word with an affliction. And I've been doing this for years, and it's been tough. And I'll tell you something. I can never preach the message of grace and peace, of forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. and any other revelation that God has given me without it. Paul said this. Paul said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Why? Anybody know why? He said, because of the abundance of the revelations. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure, he said, to keep my feet in the ground, God gave Paul a problem. And Paul said, I prayed three times for to be delivered. And what God said, he said, my grace is sufficient. He said, you go and deal with it and be patient. Okay? I'm saying that to say to you that God, I've seen God take his word and weave it into the fiber of my own life. He does that. And he does it. He's worked that kind of scenario with every prophet he's called. And you need to pray for me more than ever before. You need to pray for my family more than ever before. This has been an attack since day one, at one form or another. People say, well, Pastor Kim's the worst kids in the world. I understand why they say that. He ain't the worst kids in the world. They're the most attacked. Period. Right. Well, his family and pastor ain't got too much going for him. It's just that simple. Now, they sit over here, not because they separate themselves, but, you know, this was the church. And they sit over on their side because it's the worst view, okay? Seeing the board or anything else, all right? But they're a miracle for me. And the God has kept them and saved them. I said, I told Tiana, they should talk about Lisa, and Lisa knows about the Bible. I said, I'll tell you the truth. I said, if I ever had to be gone one Sunday and couldn't be here, I said, aside from Shelly, I said, Lisa would be in charge. <laughs> At least the only person who, who never heard anything but my teaching. Lisa had no hang-ups about what to get out of her head or anything. She knew the truth from day one. And if you ever get a chance to talk to her about the word, about, about what the scenario to come up, she gives me more inspiration and faith sometimes and what she says because it's just like, it's child faith. Just, it, that, that's the way it is. You know, sometimes I marvel. I say, you know, Lord, last time I said, Lord, get me to believe like that. <laughs> I'm preaching this, and this kid has more of a grip gra gra on it than I do, a grip than I do. You know? But that's a blessing. So I just said to you tonight to keep on praying for us. Okay? It's been a battle. It's been a warfare. And I'm not going to lose now. Period. And being in the warfare, it's done, like I said, Joseph being in prison for 12 years. He came out of prison a different person. He dealt with the world for 12 years. He was a different guy. He could bang his the world now because he knew the world. I'm in a situation I can do damage with the devil in these last days. He's made me tough and rough and crusty and mean. And we got a fight to do. Okay? So don't flake out on me now. All right?